Jeffrey Berman was the U.S. attorney in SDNY, the federal prosecutor's office in Manhattan, while all this was happening. And Jeffrey Berman technically was recused from directly overseeing this case, um, the, the hush money case, because he had been part of the Trump campaign before he was appointed U.S. attorney. And he thought that might have seemed like a conflict of interest, given that the case involved fraud allegations about campaign expend expenditures. So he was technically recused from overseeing the case, but he was in charge of the U.S. Attorney's Office when this case went to court. And in his book, in this book, Holding the Line, that Jeffrey Berman published about his time as U.S. Attorney in SDNY, he explains in detail that Maine Justice, under Trump, reached into SDNY and intervened with the prosecutor's office in Manhattan to protect Trump in this case. He says it explicitly. This is from page 24 of Jeff Berman's book. Quote, the first time Maine justice interfered, sorry, uh, even though I was not overseeing the Cohen case, I still had to deal with other issues involving it, all of them deriving from the same source, Maine justice and its attempts at interference. The first time Maine justice interfered was when the information was being finalized. Information is a term of art in this context. After Michael Cohen agreed to plead guilty, the charging instrument against him uh, became an information rather than indictment. So that was the title of the document that Berman is referencing here. It was an information. It was about 40 pages long, he says. And it, quote, referenced a person identified as individual one as having acted in concert with Michael Cohen. He says, quote, there was zero doubt as to the identity of individual one. It was Donald J. Trump. Berman says, quote, consistent with DOJ guidelines, we first submitted the information to the public integrity section at Maine Justice. They signed off. We then sent a copy to the deputy attorney general at the time, Rod Rosenstein informing him that Cohen's guilty plea was imminent. The next day, the prosecutor in my office, who was overseeing the case, received a call from Rosenstein's principal deputy. He was aggressive. Why the length, he wanted to know. He argued that now that Cohen is pleading guilty, we don't need all this description of the crime. The prosecutor responded, what exactly are you concerned about? Rosen's deputy, pr Rosenstein's de deputy proceeded to identify specific allegations that he wanted removed from the information. Almost all of them were items referencing individual one, Donald J. Trump. Quote, it quickly became apparent that it wasn't the overall length or detail of the document that concerned him. It was any mention of individual one. The two men went through a handful of these allegations, some of which the prosecutor agreed to strike, others he did not. The revised document, now 21 pages, remember it had started as 40 pages, now 21 pages, kept all of the charges to which Cohen was pleading guilty, but removed certain allegations, including allegations that Individual One acted in concert with and coordinated with Cohen on the illegal campaign contributions. Berman goes on to describe how Trump appointed Attorney General William Barr personally intervened in the hush money investigation later as well. Quote, while Cohen had pleaded guilty, our office continued to pursue investigations related to possible campaign finance violations. When Barr took over as attorney general in February 2019, six months after Cohen had pleaded guilty, Barr not only tried to kill the ongoing investigations, but incredibly suggested that Michael Cohen's conviction on campaign finance charges could be retroactively reversed. Barr summoned the prosecutor leading the hush money case in late February. So this is one of the first things Barr does when he becomes attorney general. He only becomes attorney general in February. Before the end of that month, he summons the lead prosecutor on the hush money case to, quote, challenge the basis of Cohen's guilty plea, as well as the reasoning behind pursuing similar campaign finance charges against other individuals. The prosecutor was told to cease all investigative work on the campaign finance allegations until the Office of Legal Counsel, a part of Maine Justice, determined if there was a legal basis for the campaign finance charges to which Cohen pled guilty, and until Barr determined there was a sufficient federal interest in pursuing charges against others. The directive Barr gave the prosecutor, which was amplified that same day by a follow-up phone call, was explicit. Not a single investigative step could be taken. Not a single document in our possession could be reviewed until the issue was resolved. And if Maine Justice decided there was no legal basis for the Cohen charges, the Attorney General of the United States would direct us to dismiss the guilty pleas of Michael Cohen, the man who implicated the Attorney General's boss, the President.
Berman closes with this. He says, quote, I've tried not to make assumptions about the motivations of Barr or anyone else. I am a lawyer trained to deal in fact. But Barr's posture here raises obvious questions. Did he think dropping the campaign finance charges would bolster Trump's defense against impeachment charges? Was he trying to ensure that no other Trump associates or employees would be charged with making hush money payments to perhaps flip on the president? Was it part of an effort to undo the entire series of investigations and prosecutions over the past two years of those in the president's orbit, people like Michael Cohen, Roger Stone, and Michael Flynn? Berman says, quote, was the goal to ensure that the president himself could not be charged after leaving office? Jeffrey Berman then goes on to explain in his book that Barr uh, subsequently tried to take the whole hush money case out of SDNY, take it out of his office and give it to another U.S. attorney. Berman apparently successfully blocked that effort from Barr. Berman also explains that this standoff between his prosecutor's office and Maine Justice went on for months, while Maine Justice explicitly barred SDNY federal prosecutors from looking at a single document or taking a single investigative step of any kind. While this one guy, Michael Cohen, is sentenced to prison, even though that same prosecutor's office had named another person with whom Michael Cohen committed this felony. And so, no, they never charged that other person. They never charged Trump, even though they concluded and told the court that he had committed the crime with Cohen. Never charged him, never tried to charge him, never tried to charge anyone else. And then it got worse. Because New York Times reporters William Rashbaum and Bren Ben Protess uh, reported at the New York Times in August 2019 that in addition to effectively botching this as a federal case and federal prosecution— Federal prosecutors in SDNY also blocked anyone else from pursuing this case either. I mean, making illegal campaign expenditures, whether or not you lie about it on your company books by calling it legal expenses, I mean, making illegal campaign expenditures is a crime in every state as well as a federal crime. And New York state prosecutors were therefore interested when the details of this crime became known, when, when Michael Cohen started telling Congress and telling the public what he'd been involved in, New York state prosecutors were interested in pursuing potential state charges related to this crime. But as William Rashbaum and Ben Protest reported at the New York Times, quote, the New York District Attorney's Office initially considered mounting an inquiry in 2018, but the office paused that effort at the request of federal prosecutors. So federal prosecutors get like blown up by Trump's DOJ, by main justice under Trump, for even just bringing a case against Michael Cohen. They get ordered to not investigate anyone else for these crimes. They get threatened that even Cohen's going to be let go, too, despite the fact that he pled guilty. Federal prosecutors at SDNY fold in the face of that pressure. And simultaneously, they tell state prosecutors that they can't look at the case either. You can't look at this, actually. This is, uh, the, we're, the, we're the feds and we're handling this. Yeah, the feds were not handling this. <laughs> at least they were not handling this well. But while they were botching it, they were preventing other prosecutors who could have pursued it on their own terms without pressure from main justice. And that brings us to today's news, to this finally starting to clear up. For, for, for us as a country, for finally starting to get clear of the mess that President Donald Trump and Attorney General Bill Barr made of American law, particularly where it comes to public corruption. These things don't just disappear into the ether. They create precedent. They worm away at the integrity and the basic core functions of the U.S. Justice Department. And unless and until they are fixed or corrected, it just rots the system. This stuff can't be left to dangle. It has to be tied off. Even if the federal prosecutors aren't going to do it themselves, somebody's going to have to. And today, New York Times reporter William Rashbaum and his colleagues at the Times were first to report that New York state prosecutors, as of today, have started presenting evidence to a grand jury related to this case. And this time, it is not about Michael Cohen. This time, it is finally about Trump. 
Quote, the Manhattan District Attorney's Office today began presenting evidence to a grand jury about Donald J. Trump's role in paying hush money to a porn star during his 2016 presidential campaign, laying the groundwork for potential criminal charges against the former president. The grand jury was recently impaneled. The beginning of witness testimony today represents a clear signal that the district attorney, Alvin Bragg, is nearing a decision about whether to charge Mr. Trump. And this has been a, a weird saga. This has been an on-again, off-again criminal case. At core, it is a simple crime. It is a very understandable crime, one in which the evidence is really clear. And for years now, I mean, we're going on seven years since the crime, five years since people started going to prison for it. For years now, people have been doing backflips to make sure that there are no charges, no consequences for the guy who prosecutors say committed the crime and who is the only person who benefited from it. The purpose of this crime was to help Donald Trump's campaign for president. He did become president, which apparently does give you carte blanche to stay out of handcuffs for four years while you're occupying the Oval Office. But not after. <laughs> it doesn't last once you're out. Once you are out of the Oval Office, you're supposed to go back to being the kind of person who isn't allowed to get caught committing crimes without having to pay. It has taken all of these years. I am happy to say that Stormy Daniels is doing fine. She's doing better than fine. But we're about to find out if we can say the same about the rule of law and the justice system, which they really royally screwed up in their time in office.